strongest public health systems in the nation, but even so, we aren't immune to this virus's ability to push our existing capacity beyond its limits. We need to maintain our course and keep working to flatten the curve. Here's what we know. As of March 30th, our preliminary reports from hospitals statewide show just 41% of our adult ICU beds are empty. Staffed and ready for immediate patient use, a two percentage point decrease from the moment in time numbers that I ran you through last week. And 68% of our ventilators are available statewide, a 4% point drop in a week. That doesn't mean that every hospital has that availability, availability, but collectively, that's what we have across the state. Statewide, about 35% of our total ICU beds are now occupied by COVID patients, and about 24% of our total ventilators are occupied by COVID patients. We're still within our capacity and we're working every day to acquire new ventilators or convert alternate use ventilators to increase that capacity. But from all the modeling that we've seen, our greatest risk of hitting capacity isn't right now, but weeks from now. The virus's spread is growing. So are its risks. We must not let up now. I'll remind everyone that these interventions don't work if they're piecemeal across the state. It was only a few weeks back when we had just a handful of cases all in one county. That's up to 5,994 across 54 counties. And we know that there are even more people out there who have contracted COVID-19 and already recovered without realizing it or recovered at home and never qualified for a test. That's true in all 50 states. And that's the price that we will continue to pay for the lack of early robust national testing. So we have to stick to the knowledge that we have. No community is immune. To that point, I want to discuss our efforts to keep our Department of Corrections facilities as safe and socially distanced as possible to minimize the spread of COVID-19 within those facilities. Fortunately, DOC is at its smallest population since 1995, and it currently has 36,944 individuals. That's 1,069 fewer prisoners than on February 1 of this year. On March 14th, early in the process of my issuing executive orders addressing COVID-19, to reduce the spread of the virus, DOC suspended all visits, moved all facilities to administrative quarantine, and ensured access to hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies to all staff and incarcerated individuals. IEMA and IDPH have made multiple deliveries of personal protective equipment to the Department of Corrections, totaling over 160,000 N95 masks, over 200,000 surgical masks, and tens of thousands of gloves, and DOC is sending an additional shipment to Stateville today. DOC has been reviewing the case files of as many low-risk offenders as possible for early release during this crisis, with nearly 300 more released as of 1 p.m. today. This has included some of our female inmates who are pregnant or were in our women and babies program, as well as low-level offenders at the end of their sentences. All have been thoroughly vetted to make sure that there are no histories of violence, and particularly domestic violence, and all had homes to return to. I should note that places to reside for exiting offenders are one of our greatest challenges. We need to ensure that each person released in this manner has a place to return to, and those arrangements are more difficult for exiting offenders during these challenging times. We're working hard to balance the need to free up as much space in our prisons as possible with making sure that we're not releasing those who may pose a risk to their communities. Every step we take with regard to our prison population needs to solve an existing problem, not create a new one. 
I signed an executive order to suspend the daily flow of con convicted transfers from county jails into IDOC facilities. And my office is working with the Department of Corrections to review the histories of all of our inmates to prioritize the release of older and more vulnerable residents while ensuring the public safety. Under the order, the director still has discretion to accept transfers from county jails when necessary, and he will exercise that discretion. Tragically, we have lost one patient to COVID-19 at Stateville Prison, the maximum security prison that's closest to the Chicago area, with 32 total positive cases among those in custody and more results pending. We have 18 staff members who have tested positive who are employed at various Department of Corrections facilities. The DOC is working diligently to prevent further spread by requiring all staff on duty to wear personal protective equipment and by opening parts of the facility that were closed to allow for further social distancing. We're using every mechanism available to us to prevent and contain the virus's spread in our Department of Corrections facilities, including standing up temporary facilities for an on-site medical mission with our National Guard. But I want to be clear, despite these measures and any and every one of our DOC residents, who falls seriously ill with COVID-19 will receive available medical assistance to get through it, including an ICU bed and a ventilator if necessary. An incarcerated person is a person, and my administration will not be in the business of claiming one life is worth more than another. I wanna to say to the local hospitals that are near the prison facilities, we will do all that we can to ensure that any patients receive the best care that we can provide, and we will work with local departments of public health to get you all the equipment and support that we can. But hospitals that refuse to take on residents of the Department of Corrections will be called out by name. And those that refuse to operate in accordance to their oath can and will be compelled to do so by law. We are asking everyone during this extraordinarily difficult time to do their part to keep residents, all residents of Illinois safe. We inherited a prison system that has suffered from overcrowding after decades of tough on crime policies, focusing on punishment without attention to rehabilitation. Democrats and Republicans agree on this and have worked together over the last number of years to make real changes. And while we have prioritized support services for the men and women in our care, we're still operating in facilities that were not built to support these kinds of efforts. When we get through this immediate crisis, we all need to have a real conversation about criminal justice reform and the status and conditions of our state prisons. But I'll be frank with you, we still don't know exactly when this immediate crisis will pass. And I know this continues to be an extraordinarily difficult time for families across our state, especially for our workers. I have directed my governor's office staff and agency directors to do everything and anything in our power to help our residents who are hurting. We've directed tens of millions of dollars to support our small businesses in impacted industries and offered sales tax payment delays wherever we can. We've expanded support for individuals through the ban of residential evictions, a delayed income tax filing deadline, increased unemployment eligibility, and work to expand our Medicaid and SNAP programs. There are countless unseen people in state government who are working behind the scenes day and night, seven days a week, to find every possible mechanism to support our working families. And I promise you, we will not stop until this virus passes. Lastly, I wanna talk about what this extension means for our students. Well, first and foremost, I, I wanna recognize the creativity of our Illinois State Board of Education and the superintendents and the school districts all across our state for their remarkably able and agile efforts that they've demonstrated, providing learning opportunities, meals, connection and stability throughout this crisis.
under this extended order, schools will transition from act of God days to remote learning days. All of these days count toward the school year and absolutely no days need to be made up. Each district is working with ISBE to create and implement a remote learning plan to ensure that all students, including students with disabilities and English language learners, receive instructional materials and can communicate with their teachers. Remote learning will look different for every district and maybe even for every school. School districts will create plans based upon their local resources and their needs. ISBE recommends any grades that schools give during this time be used as feedback and not as an instrument for compliance. Students are going through a situation over which they have no control. Our first response must be empathy. I want to end with a message for our students who I know never envisioned a pandemic derailing their spring semester. Believe me, as a parent of two teenagers, you're not the only one. I won't try and tell you that texting and calling each other is the same as hanging out in the hallways or in the lunchroom. And I won't try and tell you that a Zoom prom is the same as a real prom. I won't try and tell you not to be sad about the lost goals and plans that you may have had for March and April. It's okay to be sad. And if you do feel sad or frustrated or angry, whatever you feel, please let yourself feel that way. Don't beat yourself up over being human. And if you're experiencing overwhelming anxiety or you have a friend who is and you need someone to talk to, there are resources available to you by phone and online through both ISBE and our Department of Human Services, as well as the city of Chicago. But I also want to say something else. Once you're ready, take a look around. Take in the incredibly unique moment that you're living in. Yes, it's scary and it's uncertain and it's difficult. But if you're looking for a lesson in the fundamental goodness of people and of your community, it's right there in front of you. Take a look at the districts across the state that have taken it upon themselves to support our healthcare workers, like Tinley Park High School's science department delivering goggles to Advocate Health's Christ Medical Center, or Decatur Public Schools donating over 200 iPads to promote contactless communication at area hospitals. Maybe those are your teachers and administrators, or maybe your school is one of the many that have made donations. Even if it's not, I bet people in your school are finding a way to help. Be one of those people. Or look at Michael Arundel, an Orland Park native, home from college while classes are out at the University of Alabama, where he's studying to go to medical school someday. He came home and he saw a need where his elderly relatives and neighbors were afraid to go to the grocery store. So he filled that need by creating Leave It To Us, his free service to go grocery shopping for senior citizens. Orders took off and his network of mostly college-aged volunteers is now launching service in five other states nationwide. Michael, thank you for your movement, the movement that you have started. All of Illinois is proud of you. And I want to encourage our elderly Chicagoland residents, as well as healthy young people across the state looking to join Michael and start a local branch of their own to visit his website. It's at covidseniorshoppers.com, covidseniorshoppers.com. And most of all, look at the people who make up our healthcare workforce, our doctors, our physician's assistants, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, yes, but also our hospital social workers, EMTs, pharmacists, our ER technicians, registration staffers, sanitation services, and the food service workers who keep patients fed. Maybe you call one of those people a parent a sibling, a cousin, a friend. Maybe someday that'll be you. I can tell you that they didn't join this profession looking to fight a pandemic. They wanted to help people to live a life of service. And they're doing that still 
even though they share the fear and uncertainty that we all do. No, it's not the school year you bargained for, and I'm terribly sorry for that. But amidst these dire circumstances, I want you to know that there are plenty of people to learn from. There's plenty of reason to hope. And if all else fails, I've heard that Where's Lightfoot meme page is a good place to go for a laugh. Um, so thank you, and I want to turn it over to the star of Where's Lightfoot, the uh, city of Chicago's mayor, Lori Lightfoot. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, we all do need a little bit of a laugh and some humor. As I said uh, the other day, <clears throat> the thing that I like most about the memes and the uh, videos that we put out is it gives people hope. And hope means healing. And that's what we need in this time. So thank you, Governor Pritzker. Um, as we just heard from the governor, this virus is lethal and growing. That is why I fully support the governor's bold but necessary extension of the stay-at-home order. And this may not be what residents want, but it is what we need. And the city of Chicago stands ready to continue to partner with the state in any way possible as we navigate the challenges that lie ahead. Just as we heard, to pretend this crisis is anything less than dangerous, um, that, would only, that would not only be irresponsible, but it would be deadly. And here's the reality that we all know. The numbers of cases will continue to rise and get worse before it gets better. That is why we've been directing the full power of our city government to stay ahead of this crisis, to flatten the curve and to save lives. Uh, earlier today, I joined with local public safety union leaders to announce the city of Chicago will be opening up additional hotel space for our first responders who are fighting COVID in order to provide them with a safe space to stay during this crisis. Uh, this involves the Hotel Essex, uh, providing 274 rooms for our first responders. And thanks again to the Oxford Group for their incredible civic leadership and partnering with us in this effort. Meanwhile, in partnership with the governor and his team, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers and IEMA, we are diligently working to convert McCormick Place into an alternative care site with the goal of 3,000 beds in order to relieve the strain on our hospital resources. And we will continue to take additional proactive measures based upon our anticipated need all of which builds on the measures we have been putting in place now for weeks related to everything from food assistance, child care, small business support, housing, and much, much more. However, more is still needed. That is why, again, we are calling on Chicagoans to explore volunteer and employment opportunities during this crisis. Now is the time to step up, as so many of you have. If you want to help, we have a job for you. This especially goes for individuals with medical training, doctors, nurses, assistants, hospital administrators, and the governor ran through the list. Everyone in the entire hospital ecosystem, we need you. Medical professionals connect, can connect the, with Chicago Medical Reserve Corps. This is a network of both medical and non-medical professionals who volunteer their time to assist during emergencies like the one that we're in, to register, please visit illinoishelps.net. That's illinoishelps.net. And anyone interested in stepping up in any way can visit our website, chicago.gov forward slash coronavirus. Our needs don't end with health care. We also need help with food assistance, child care, financial donations, and much more. There are groups like the Greater Chicago Food Depository, the United Way, Salvation Army, and many, many more who are really stepping up in this time of need, the YMCA and others. You, there, if you go to the website, you'll find ways uh, to uh, volunteer and help, whether as a volunteer or as an employee. And I want to say thanks uh, to the folks who have been going into their own pockets to feed our health care workers and our first responders. And, while, and give them some choices while restaurants are on reduced service. We have especially have a need on the third watch. That's the midnight shift. All your donations are much appreciated. 
For all this, the first step in combating COVID-19 is following the governor's stay-at-home order. Stay home, save lives, period. The fewer people who stay home, the longer this crisis will last, and candidly, the more people who will die. And the longer it will take us to recover. It's just the simple facts. Finally, I'd take, like to say a word in respect to our schools and city colleges during this extended order. Obviously, consistent with this extension, CPS schools will remain closed through April 30th. CPS will reach out to faculty and staff and families to provide further guidance. Also, as announced yesterday, the remote learning plans of both the Chicago Public Schools and City Colleges will continue as planned to ensure our students won't be shortchanged on their education despite these unprecedented circumstances. Our remote learning plans will remain in effect throughout the duration of the stay-at-home order. And as I said yesterday, we will not allow this crisis to stand in the way of our children's future and their dreams. And I'd like to once again express my heartfelt gratitude to our city's educators for their work to get this new curriculum model off the ground and running in a short amount of time. And thanks, of course, to the lunchroom staff and others who are working so hard to make sure that our students are fed. With that, I'd now like to welcome uh, Illinois' Director of Public Health, Dr. Uh, Izike, to the podium. Doctor. So we come before you each day to encourage you to continue the fight against this deadly disease. To arm you, we want to bring you data, facts, and science. Several scientific studies have shown that physical distancing, social distancing works in reducing the number of people infected. Extending the stay-at-home order is key to reducing the spread of the virus and the number of people who become ill. As you know, those who are moderately ill may need medical care. And although those individuals may not require an ICU bed, may not require intubation and a ventilator, they will still need doctors and nurses and the medical professionals who tend to them will still need the personal protective equipment to care for those who are moderately ill. We want to make sure that we have enough resources for those who are the sickest in order to reduce the overall number of people who are exposed and infected with COVID-19. We see that there are some hospitals that are increasing are reaching capacity of the number of ICU and ventilators. And we want to make sure that everyone who needs an ICU bed, everyone who needs a ventilator will get the care they need. And that's why it's so important that we flatten the curve. The concern is that our medical resources will be stretched to their limits. And so that's why staying at home will help us have the health care capacity we need. We are seeing for today that the number of cases in Illinois is 5,994, including 99 deaths. This is an increase of 937 cases from yesterday, and we've added 26 fatalities. We did know that these numbers would increase and we did unfortunately know that there would be additional fatalities. And we also know that all the illness is not reflected in these numbers because of the limits of testing. But I do want to put these numbers in perspective and remind you that the majority of those that get infected do not suffer severe illness, do not require hospitalization. What we do need to pay attention to with these numbers is what they mean for our healthcare capacity. So we keep reminding of the need to flatten the curve. The most severely ill will need hospitalization and we want to be able to provide that. We are prioritizing testing for those who are 65 years and older and those with the most severe symptoms. 
We also want to test those in the correctional facilities. We also want to test those in the nursing home and other long-term care facilities. By testing those with the most severe illness and those at the highest risk, we will hopefully see the number of cases and the number of deaths increase with early identification. Early data does show that the vast majority of people, we think up to 80%, will not need any severe or critical care. We all need to do our part by staying home in order to reduce the spread. To better understand the effects of this virus, IDPH recently sent a survey to COVID-19 cases and asked about their re recovery. It was sent to people who tested positive who were at least seven days after their positive test result. Of those that responded, 48% indicated that they had recovered. And as we get more responses, we hope to show you that with more time, even more have fully recovered. I also want to share an update on the death of the infant that was reported earlier. Health officials are talking with pediatricians, are talking with the family, are talking with the hospital, the medical examiner, to discuss the entire medical history, all the way to acquiring all of the immunization dates. The CDC is on board and is partnering with the teams as we try to provide further information. Please understand that this investigation is ongoing, and I thank everyone for their patience as these details do take time to collect. Our focus right now is preventing infection and the need for hospitalization, and the science has shown us that physical distancing will help, so please stay home. And as we get more information, more data, more science, we'll share with you. The CDC just recently put out new guidance in the last 24 hours saying that we should be concerned about people transmitting the virus even 24 or 48 hours before symptoms become. So that's even further evidence that we need to stay home. You can't eyeball someone and think you know if they're sick or not. Let's continue to do what we've been telling ourselves to do, washing our hands, staying home, covering our cough, cleaning frequently touched surfaces. Let's do it all for ourselves, for our family, and for our community. And now I will summarize these comments in Spanish. Venemos aquí cada día a dar ánimo a todos por seguir la lucha contra el epidemia. Para hacer esto, ustedes necesitan ciencia, los hechos y datos. Varios estudios científicos demuestran que el distanciamiento social funciona para reducir la cantidad de personas infectadas con COVID-19. El CDC nos informa nuevamente que gente puede contratar COVID-19 de gente uno o dos días antes de que muestran síntomas. El orden de quedarse en casa es clave para reducir la transmisión del virus y la cantidad de personas que se enferman. Necesitamos reservar nuestros recursos para la gente más enfermos Y una de las mejores maneras de hacerlo es reducir el número total de personas infectadas con COVID-19. Ya estamos viendo 5,994 número de casos, incluidas 99 muertes. Este es un aumento de 937 casos de ayer y 26 muertes adicionales. Esperábamos que los números crecieron y esperábamos, esperamos que continúan creciendo a medida que las pruebas están más disponibles. Pero es importante poner estos números en, perspe en perspectiva y recordar que hay más infecciones que estos números y que la mayoría de los infectados no son enfermedades graves. A lo que sí debemos prestar atención con estos números es lo que significan para nuestra capacidad de atención médica. Los enfermeros más graves necesitan hospitalización 
y atención médica, lo que acerca nuestra capacidad de atención médica. Estamos priorizando las pruebas para los mejoras de 65 años y gente con síntomas graves, y también las personas que están en los cárcel y en los asilos de ancianos. Lo que esos números nos muestran en este momento es la cantidad de personas que no son positivas con COVID-19. Para comprender mejor los efectos de este virus, IDPH recientemente envió una encuesta a los casos de COVID-19 y le preguntó sobre su recuperación. De los enviados, el 48% indicó que están recuperados. A medida que reciba, recibamos más respuestas, esperamos ver crecer el pro, porcentaje de recuperados. También quiero compartir información sobre la muerte del bebé que falleció. Oficiales han hablado con el doctor, la familia, el hospital, el médico forense para analizar la historia médica del bebé hasta las fechas de vacu vacunas. Conectamos con la CDC para obtener más información y ayuda con las pruebas. La investigación está en curso. Les agradezco a todos por su paciencia porque estos detalles tarden en formar. Nuestro enfoque en este momento es prevenir la infección y la necesidad de hospitalización. La ciencia nos ha demostrado que el distanciamiento social ayuda. Así que, por favor, quédase en casa. Hazlo por ti mismo, por tu familia y tu comunidad. Gracias. And with that, I will turn it over to President Drea. Uh, thank you, Doctor, Governor, Mayor. Um, we greatly appreciate your leadership and the constant communication both of your offices as having with us during this trying time. As we enter into this uh, fourth week of this pandemic, we are seeing claims for unemployment benefits rise to unbelievable levels. These staggering unemployment numbers put a human face on the severity of this crisis. Unfortunately, as this crisis continues, the numbers of unemployed will also increase. However, no unemployment statistic can tell the story of the number of Illinoisans going to work each day to deliver the goods and services desperately needed to combat this pandemic. Not everyone can stay at home and out of harm's way. There are many working people on the front lines making sure the citizens of Illinois receive the essential services they need and deserve. For example, nurses and other health care workers healing the sick from this virus and other ailments. Public employees delivering vital government services. Letter carriers and postal workers delivering mail and packages. Firefighters and paramedics responding to emergencies. Child care case workers protecting our children and police officers patrolling our streets. Food producers and grocery workers making sure grocery shelves are stocked. Manufacturing workers uh, making um, PPE and other vital products to get us through this pandemic. Trade workers uh, at power generating stations keeping the lights on. Transportation workers keeping the buses and the uh, uh, trains running. Maintenance workers disinfecting public spaces and public buildings. And construction workers who continue to build for the future and propping up needed medical facilities, including an additional 3,000 beds at McCormick Place right here in Chicago. Let's take a minute to think of what these workers and their families are going through every day. These workers and many others are going to work on all shifts and at great personal risk to themselves and their families. Before each shift, they kiss their loved ones goodbye and leave for work. The question, will they be exposed to the virus today? And if so, will they take the virus home to their families? Their sacrifices are real and meaningful. We owe them more than our gratitude. While social distancing is critical, these frontline workers are in desperate need of PPE and access to testing immediately. We join with Governor Pritzker, Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth, and the Illinois congressional delegation to urge the president to utilize the Defense Production Act, to mobilize all of industry, to produce the safety items workers desperately need to protect themselves and their families. 
we further call upon OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard to protect all workers at potential risk of occupational exposure to infectious diseases, including COVID-19. On behalf of the nearly 1 million workers of organized labor throughout Illinois, the Illinois AFL-CIO will continue to advocate for the health and safety of each and every worker currently engaged in the fight to defeat this virus. All of us depend on, all of us depend on them staying healthy and safe to keep up the fight. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Brad Cole of the Illinois Municipal League. Thank you, Brad. On behalf of the 1,298 cities, villages, and towns throughout Illinois, all represented by the Illinois Municipal League, I'm here today to again stand with you, Governor, in full partnership with your team as we, the local elected officials from across our state, fully cooperate to administer the various compliance and enforcement components of your executive orders. When the governor announced the first stay at home order to begin on March 21, local leaders asked for the public's patience and understanding. In the days that followed, that request was heightened as additional stricter measures were needed to get some of the public's attention. Today, we call on our constituents to remain determined along with us to stay home, save lives, and to exercise the resilience that we all believe is one of Illinois' finest traits. Municipal law enforcement agencies and public safety personnel, public works crews and administrative and professional staff have all responded to the needs of their communities during these past 10 days. That will continue through the next 30 days, or sooner or later as may be necessary. We will keep the cities of this state functioning, your neighborhood safe, your business secure, your trash picked up, your kitchen faucet running, and your toilet flushing. Municipal operations will continue, although obviously limited to essential functions. We will respond as we are able to all of the various aspects of local government that support residents and businesses, and we will adapt and adjust to new standards of service delivery wherever possible. The faster we seriously comply with the executive orders, the faster we will be able to slow and stop the spread of this virus, and the faster we will then be able to turn on the economic engines of Illinois' communities from large to small. Illinois is a world-class state that is home to world-class cities that are home to the finest people we know. That is something that this public health crisis cannot and will not change. As I have stated previously, community leaders prepare for and effectively handle natural disasters and unknown events as best we can, and we approach this no differently. Governor. Thank you. Happy to take any questions, the mayor, me, or anybody who's up here today. Because we don't know that, the, in fact, that uh, this uh, need for a stay-at-home order will go beyond May 1, uh, and that's why we haven't extended the order beyond that. I mean, we're trying to follow the best science. You know, you heard the the CDC uh, and the President of the United States suggesting that April 30th um, was the extension date that they put forward. Um, that's, you know, we had been thinking that if we needed to extend and it was looking like we would, that we would go to the end of April. And so that's the date we chose. What would it take to shorten it? Well, we need to see, first of all, we have to see the peak here. We, we haven't seen the peak and, and there's no perfect model that you can look at, you know, whether it's a University of Washington model or, or any other. And we've got great institutions here in Illinois that have done a lot of modeling uh, based upon the science and the, the, the medical doctors and their estimations. But um, the truth is that we don't know when we're gonna peak and we don't know when we're gonna come off that peak. And so I think we're, look, everybody's taking their best um, educated look at what date seems appropriate and this is the best educated you know date that they've come up with between the experts and um, those of us who know something about um, you know how to manage uh, city and state matters uh, a question about that because I also have a question about unemployment 
But yes. Once we do hit that, then what happens? Do we have to wait two weeks? Do, is it only a month? What should people do? Again, it's hard to say, and you don't see anybody around the country answering that question either because, you know, people think, well, peak, you know, and you look at, um, you know, some of these curves that are just, you know, broadly kind of drawn on a piece of paper um, uh, or on a poster board like this, and, you know, it looks like you've come, you know, immediately off of a peak. Um, what we're seeing in uh, places like New York is uh, that the peak may last for, you know, several days or more. Who knows? Um, that that they're seeing this in other places around the world as well. That you know you might peak. And remember, the whole idea here is to make sure that we're keeping patients safe. You know, at home if they don't need to be in a hospital, hospitalized if they need to be, ICU beds, and so on. But we really want people not to get this in the first place, so that we can keep them away from the medical institutions, the hospitals, so that we can manage through this. Because ultimately, people are getting it and we want them to get it over some period of time. So I think we're going to peak and, and, you know, head down the other side, but I could not tell you when that is. That's why we're, you know, a little uncertain about exactly what date we might be able to come off. But we think that April 30 is a, a good end date for now. Governor, um, so we've had a lot of emails and calls about gig workers getting unemployment and they're not Most gig workers actually, uh, by virtue of the federal stimulus package, um, should be able to access either a stimulus check or a uh, an unemployment claim. So we'll, we'll be happy to work with people So if they don't fully understand. We have a hotline that people can call. Um, I do suggest that people go online and look at what their rights are based upon that um, federal stimulus package. But, um, but our intention here is to take care of them as well. We have many of them in the city of Chicago. I don't know That's if right. Mayor, you'd like to respond to that as well. Well, I think uh, the governor's got it exactly right, but we know that um, for some uh, folks, they can't wait. That's why we started um, several weeks ago announcing a small business resiliency fund to help um, small businesses be able to meet their payroll. That's why we made the announcement last week about helping people be able to meet their uh, rent and mortgage payments. That's why the Chicago Community Trust and United Way started a fund that's now, I think, in excess of $15 million to help those community organizations um, and their workers make sure that they can continue to do um, the necessary and good work in neighborhoods. So we are putting together both at the city level and the state level, um, an array of resources, all intended to help residents um, that are in need. And we'll continue to look and explore lots of different ways. When we, I think, have a better sense of the money that's actually gonna be flowing uh, to the state and to the city, um, there are gonna be more opportunities for us to be able to step up and help as well. Hey, yes. Go, go ahead, Dana. Oh, yes. All that remains closed. If you look at the order that we issued last week, um, the order says it's in effect until further notice um, of the Commissioner of Public Health. So there's no time limit on when those will um, uh, those uh, closures uh, will end. Obviously, we'll do it consistent with the stay at home order, um, but also we're going to be guided as we all are by whatever the data and the science tells us, but they remain closed. Well, look, it, it's challenging. You know, part of the reason we decided to have a little fun um, and put out our own PSAs uh, about staying home is um, people are hungry for activity. I mean, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, opening day, I think, at Wrigley was, should have been today. Um, I've missed the opening day of Sox and the Chicago Fire, uh, the NCAA March Madness. So, you know, it's not just sports, but people are really um, challenging themselves to figure out creative ways that they can distract themselves from the concern and fear that they realistically have, and, and we understand that. So we're going to keep messaging the folks um, to give them things. We're going to be bringing a couple things online. That's a little tease uh, um, in Chicago to um, really, I think, draw upon the great artistic talent that we have in the city. Um, but we people want content and they want to be distracted from the day to day, and I get that. But I'm, I, as I've said before, 
I'm really gratified that since we um, entered the order last week, we've seen virtually uniform uh, compliance across the city. A couple spots um, that we're working on, but even there, um, day over day, we're seeing a drastic reduction in a number of dispersal orders um, that the uh, Chicago Police Department um, has had to give. But I think getting people psychologically prepared, um, which we've done over these last few weeks, um, people understand and are starting to really get it that staying home really will make a huge difference in flattening the curve, getting us to the peak sooner rather than later, and then down on the other side of the, of the steep slope. We'll do one more in the room, and then we got to get to the online okay. questions. Go ahead. No, I don't, I don't know that your number of four is correct. But look, the reality is this is a virus that doesn't discriminate. People of all walks of life, every geography, and every kind of job type are going to test positive for this disease. It, is, it, is, it doesn't discriminate. Um, we have done um, and will continue to do a range of things at Vital City Services, of course, the Water Department being uh, among them, to make sure that we are um, very responsive uh, to any um, uh, worker who tests positive. But in addition to that, We've been at this now for several weeks, really educating members of our workforce about what they should do, what signs they should look for. But the thing that we've got to keep doing that some folks unfortunately haven't gotten the message is when you are sick, and to quote Dr. Arwadi, even a little bit, you've got to stay at home. And we've seen instances, unfortunately, of workers, and I won't call any out, that are trying to tough it out and go to work sick. That is the wrong thing to do in this time. If you've got any of the signs, a cough, a cold, any kind of upper respiratory issues, um, or any other sickness that makes your underlying medical conditions potentially be exacerbated, you should stay home. That's what we want, and really that's what we need to be able to save lives. And Craig, let me just add one thing to that, which is people should know their water supply is safe yeah. just because there may be a worker or several workers who may feel they have COVID-19 or even get tested positive. Water supply is safe. It won't be traveling through your pipes and uh, into your home. So, Okay. Um, this one is for the medical professionals up there. The Illinois Nurses Association says there is a critical shortage of disposable thermometer probes, so they are being told to save them so they can be sanitized with bleach and heat and reused. If Have we heard about this, if there is a shortage, and what should healthcare workers do? So thank you for that question. So we know that this is an epidemic, this pandemic is, is global, and so supplies are, are scarce throughout the country. Um, if people have uh, I, uh, items that, have, that can be reused with certain sanitation mechanisms, we have some guidance that we've given for certain um, equipment on our website in terms of you know, PPE, and there also are definitely instructions for medical equipment. So those should be followed. Things should be um, disinfected with approved um, approved products. And we definitely want to be able to stretch out our supplies, um, but we also know that everybody is working hard to, ad to obtain additional supplies so that we can have what we need to do the best job we can for all the people that we're taking care of, because of course we support our nurses completely. Governor, groups have called on you to overturn the ban on rent control. Is this something that you have the power to do? And if not, what is the state doing to aid residents who have lost jobs and will have difficulty paying rent next month? And what advice do you have for people in those situations? There is currently in state law a moratorium on rent control, so that's not something that under an executive order that I can overturn. Uh, however, as many of you know, uh, we've issued executive orders to ban evictions across the state. Uh, to make sure that people are uh, not uh, having their utilities turned off. So we have a moratorium on shutoffs of any utility that you may be uh, utilizing. Uh, and we've provided other supports for, uh, you know, for working families and really everybody across the state uh, to make sure that they're uh, taken care of. And, and you know, we're, we, we obviously, 
I said yesterday something very important for people to recognize, which is your healthcare workers who are coming home and um, any, anybody who's experiencing a landlord who's hassling them about the fact that they may be exposed because they're a healthcare worker um, and interfering with their right to uh, rent uh, in a building uh, needs to come forward because we will go after those landlords. Yes, everything that has been in place up to now will uh, be extended through April 30th, through the, you know, the night of April 30th. Yep. Are you considering designating COVID-specific <clears throat> nursing homes? My understanding is that other states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and others are doing this, and that Illinois nursing homes are concerned about mixing COVID residents with non-COVID residents. Yep. So uh, the challenge, just to, to be clear about that, is that often there are uh, nursing home residents who can't be moved. And indeed, the best advice by doctors has been don't move patients if you can quarantine them in place. And so we're trying hard within the uh, nursing homes that exist today um, to have COVID patients in one area of a nursing home. Many times there are wings, floors, and so on in a nursing home. And we're trying to separate the, those who are COVID positive, those who maybe uh, have been exposed to somebody with COVID-19 uh, uh, and those who don't have it. Um, and we're, frankly, those are the divisions that we're trying to keep uh, around the state in every way we can. Will you move to expand mail-in ballots or make that the norm for future elections? Well, I've been an, uh, you know, an, uh, an advocate for mail-in ballots for a long time anyway, um, but I do think that uh, we're going to have to look at, for the general election, uh, the idea that we may have to move to significant amount or maybe all mail-in ballots or at least giving people the opportunity to do that. Um, and so we're going to look at that, but that is something that the legislature needs to do. Um, and so, you know, we have to find a way to get the legislature together. That's going to be a decision that gets made by the legislative leaders, along with our public health professionals, uh, to determine how you get, you know, 177 General Assembly members in the, you know, similar area um, and vote on things, let alone, you know, how they'll manage through committees. Grocery store workers and delivery services you deem essential have gone on strike. Amazon fired one worker who organized the strike. Do you support their movement and is it appropriate to strike during a pandemic? Well, I've been a lifelong supporter of labor unions. I, I believe it's a fundamental right to collectively bargain. Um, so, you know, my, my view is that we, we are in a very difficult moment, there's no doubt about it. And the conditions, you know, you heard uh, Mr. Dre talk about the conditions that people are working under and, you know, making sure that there are standards that are set in these very unusual times. Um, look, I support workers and I also have talked to many, many businesses. They want to work this out. Um, the workers, the, the, the unions, and the uh, businesses are talking, um, and I certainly have tried to, you know, wherever I could to create a bridge for them. Uh, so I, I hope and believe that these things will get worked out. With the tenfold increase in unemployment claims, does Illinois have enough unemployment savings to pay out all of the applicants? As of 1-1-2020, the state has $1.4 in unemployment funds. Yeah, the answer is no, but um, fortunately, the federal government in the latest stimulus package provided a significant amount of funding for unemployment. Um, we are also allowed in a state to, um, you know, dip below uh, uh, the reserves that exist uh, if we need to, to borrow from the federal government. But the federal government has done a great job of uh, providing funding, I believe we're going to need more. I mean, I think I said this at a press conference with Senator Durbin was here. Um, we're going to have to see another relief package because uh, not only is there an unemployment problem, which, you know, hopefully it will be only four months or so long, but uh, there's also a challenge to all of our uh, city budgets and state budgets, and it goes beyond what was provided in uh, the federal stimulus that was passed just recently. Um, and, you know, th these, we have to address these things. And so I know that Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth, and the entire congressional delegation is concerned to make sure that we're able to meet our obligations in the state and in our cities. So I know we'll get more help from them. I'm hopeful that the, uh, the United States Senate, United States House, and the President will uh, come to an agreement as they finally did on this last uh, relief package. 
Do you support the idea of temporary licenses for nursing students to get more help in hospitals? Ohio just approved a similar plan to get thousands of students into hospitals. Yes, indeed. We've been uh, spending quite a lot of time. I've got a terrific legal team working together with our IDFPR professionals uh, to look at um, giving temporary licenses to people who are mostly trained, who are nearly uh, graduated. We have nursing students who are a month away or two months away from graduation. Um, they're, you know, they're capable of being healthcare professionals even now. We need them in the healthcare field. Um, same thing with medical students and others. Uh, there are people, as I said, a, a few, uh, you know, press conferences ago, there are people who left the profession and no longer have their license because they didn't re-up it. They didn't intend to come back um, to the profession. Either they started a business or did something else with their lives. Um, and we've asked them to come back in and we're giving them temporary licenses as well. So yes, we need everybody and anybody that has um, medical training to help us in this endeavor. I mean, just think of the hospitals that we're turning on across the state that we're expanding capacity and then think about McCormick Place with 3,000 potential patients. You know, we need healthcare workers and we need to add to our workforce in every and any way we can. That's um, currently in a bankruptcy proceeding, um, and so we're we're following it closely. That is certainly a um, uh, a facility that we would like to be able to look at, work with, um, but because it's in bankruptcy court, we we can't yet uh, do that. I have a question for Doctor. Doctor, as it relates to mentioned sure. uh, further looking into the death of this infant, tangentially, you said something about immunization. Without at greater risk. I was just trying to say that it's an exhaustive investigation where they're looking at all medical records and documents for the child, trying to see if there's anything that can give us a clue towards this unfortunate outcome. Well, this will be the last question. I have a question also for Dr. Duquesne, if I may. We have been getting emails from nurses from various hospitals who say they don't feel safe at work because they can't wear masks. That masks only allowed if they have to treat a COVID-19 patient, but they're still worried. We're telling people, of course, to be safe, yet many hospital workers, at least reaching out to us, say they don't feel safe. Your thoughts on that and what should be done if nurses are indeed in some facilities being told don't wear a mask unless you are treating a COVID-19 patient. Right. So again, as I just shared that the, the guidance and the information, the epidemiologic data is giving us new information every day. And so we have to be sensitive to today. In the last 24 hours, the CDC has said that we are more concerned that there is a transmission in the 24 to 48 hours, even before the symptoms start in some cases. And so armed with that information, that means that all of us will have to relook at some of, you know, hospitals and different um, uh, professional groups will have to look at what this new information tells us and what that means in terms of our practices. And so that would suggest that we don't know exactly who is COVID positive. We don't know if just being symptomatic, that is not alone the sign that you should protect yourself. And so those guidances are going to have to affect our, our practices. And that might mean that more people will need to use PPE in more situations. And may I just add that, that every hospital in Illinois is in touch with the CDPH, the IDPH, um, their local health departments, and we have shipped PPE of all sorts, including the, you know, whether it's medical general masks or surgical masks or N95 masks, uh, even KN95 masks, which have now been approved for this sort of use um, all across the state. So uh, we, it's not that, that everybody's got you know, swimming in uh, PPE, but everybody has the necessary PPE across the state. Um, and if you don't, if you're in a healthcare facility that doesn't for some reason, which we're not hearing that from the facilities, but if for some reason that happens, they know, the facilities know that they can reach out either to their local health department in their county 
or, or the city health department in the case of the city of Chicago, um, or directly to uh, our IDPH, because we will, and IEMA, we will make sure that there is PPE. And as I've said at every one of my press conferences, I have a team of people who are working night and day and succeeding in many cases to find the kind of PPE we need. Um, and we hope to you know, keep restocking our stores because as soon as it comes in, we're basically sending it out to all those facilities to keep those professionals protected. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.